This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions of software engineering topics at least once a month. SE Radio is brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine, online at computer.org slash software. Hello, this is Josh Long for Software Engineering Radio. Today I have with me Yoram Bares. Yoram founded the Activity Project in 2010 together with Tom Baines at Alfresco. Previously at JBoss and Red Hat, he worked on the JPBM open source workflow project. For his day-to-day -day work, he works on the Activity open source project uh, and the Activity commercial product. He lives in Brussels, Belgium with two kids and a little dog, and he's a jiu-jitsu teacher for kids. Thank you, Yoram, for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yoram and I work together uh, in that I am sometimes a contributor to the Activity Open Source Project. I mentioned that in the interest of transparency. So, Yoram, tell us a little bit about the landscape for workflow projects today. So, the workflow projects, it's, it's been interesting times nowadays. So, um, as you might, might have, have read in all of the blogs and articles on the internet, BPM and so Business Process Management and Workflow always go through this, this cycle of, of, um, of hype and then again being, being seen as boring. But what we've seen in the last couple of years um, is that, that business process management definitely has been grown in a lot of, of big companies. Um, and, and there are a lot of theories around that. One is that the economical crisis is due to it and people want to get insight in how they're working and make it, their work more efficient. Um, and other people, they just believe that, that it's, it's, it's in people's nature to, to want to structure their work, definitely in these times where you've got a lot of data, where you've got all these, these uh, instant messages going around, all these tweets, all these emails, where you want to, to get a crisp, clear overview of what you're actually doing now, what your company is doing now, and that is where business process management shines. So, so given that, we do see a lot of uptake in, in workflow and business process management projects um, in the markets. Otherwise, we wouldn't be around anymore, of course. Are there other projects that serve this space as well? Other products? Yeah, oh, ab absolutely, absolutely. So you've got uh, a lot of, of commercial products. You've got, uh, yeah, obviously the big ones, Oracle, IBM, uh, Tipco. Um, the, 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 there are the ones which, which I think are, are the, um, let's say, let's say the, the better BPM products in the sense that, that feature-wise, I think they're nicer than the typical vendors, which are like Appian or Pega systems. And then you've got the open source ones. So you've got, uh, obviously, Activity. I'm going to mention that first. I'm a little bit biased. But you also got, got Bonita and you've got uh, JBPM. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a crowded space. And, and there were uh, quite a bit of, um, let's say, mergers in the last couple of years. But there's still a lot of, of vendors out there. It's a crowded market, but it's also um, a big market. Now, the numbers vary but, but uh, between, the, between the analysts, but, but they're talking about, about billions of, of dollars in that market. So there's a lot of the pie to share. Has open source disrupted this space? Um, <laughs> I like to think so, obviously, but uh, again, I have a little bit of a bias. Um, I think so. Um, it, when, when I started doing business process management, uh, well, let me think, it's almost eight or nine years ago. Now, oh, geez, I'm getting old. Um, then... There wasn't that much open source uh, business process management. There, there were projects, of course, but but typically when when I went to a, so I was a consultant back in the day. Uh, but when you go went to a customer, they would look at big vendors first to to solve their needs. And that that, that has changed um, actually in the last year. We've got all of the let's say the big analysts um, from from big analyst firms coming to us asking us questions about how to do this because. Their customers are asking about these open source BPM projects. They see that uh, by using open source business process management engines, they get more uh, technical power, let's say, uh, versus the, the black box servers that, uh, that a typical vendor would offer. And that is something that appeals to many uh, companies, that, that many companies. Now, you've got to divide. You've got, of, co of course, the open source project engines are going to be much more uh, liked by companies who have a very strong tech uh, crowd, so, so that's where we typically play. It's it's with the tech crowd, um, and when you've got more business people in the company and less tech people, that's that's where it's a harder sell, let's say, for for an open source process engine because obviously um, open source sometimes is scary, even though it is it is 
not not rightfully so in, on the contrary actually uh, yeah recent reports or many reports actually have shown that open source software is a lot more secure uh, than, than than proprietary software but still it lives in the mind of the people and that's still a battle we have to do not for tech people but for non-tech people to convince them of, of the quality of the software but for tech people it's it's a given um, so yeah I'm do I do hope in the next couple of years that 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 battle will get easier for us when you talk about tech people versus not tech people is that divide along the use of the technology are black box yes. servers from yes. Oracle more of a standalone installation versus yeah. a, an API in a library yeah absolutely that's that's a very fair point I have to take a step, a step back here so um, business process management is is from a technology point of view let's say if, you, if you're a developer and you look at it you, you would say okay this is nice but what is it offered to me right you, you can see the benefits but you there's a certain threshold to get there now if you take the non-tech people in account that's where business process management really shines because you've got this system which allows you to define how a certain system should work visually and you've got people on both sides both business side and the non-business side who know how to read that that uh, diagram you have who know how to interpret that what it means when it is ex- executed and so business process management to me so there, there are a lot of books being written about this but to me that's why actually I started um, to get interested in it uh, years ago is that it solves that that old problem that we ha- all have as developers that there is this gap between non-tech people business people and tech people and they, they don't speak the same language and, and we try to solve it by writing word documents and excel sheets with all kinds of use case and, and user requirements and whatever and but still projects fail so in my head um, and in my experience business process management tries to solve that problem it has this common language between those two kinds of people which normally have a very hard time communicating and and that is what for me makes business process management um, interesting so if you then coming back to your question if you take that in account then yes a typical standalone black box um, uh, server will allow you to do that will allow you to, to model your process and run it but there is no insight in, in in how you could could mingle that with your code so that's where the embedded engines like activity shine so if you're a developer you want to hook that into your transactions if you're using spring if you're using jta you're using java ee whatever you want to hook that in with your logic right you want to to say look if you do this line of code then actually you need to trigger this workflow or you need to continue this workflow or create this task for this user and with a, with a standalone server you, you you can do that but it's it's really hard and there is no uh, let's say you can't hook into the transaction so if the transaction fails there is no general rollback of of the of the both data points and and so it, it's it's much harder and that's that's why i think uh, but again i'm biased <laughs> being being uh, uh, the founder of activity that developers really like the fact that you've got this this language that both people speak, right? The diagram, but at the same time you're not losing any technical power. You just can do programming as before. You, it is not invasive. And in my mind, typical big black box servers they are invasive. They do need. They do have a big impact on your on your architecture. While Activity hasn't. But if the embedded solution is to serve both technical people and business analysts. Does it not also need to cater to the experience of the business analysts, of the business people, of the non-technical people? Yes, yes, absolutely. Does it absolutely. need to have visual tooling, for example? Uh, it does, it does. Now, like five years ago, we could get away with it. We could say, look, this is this is an XML file, let's say, because because the PPMN language is the language that Activity uh, executes, right, in the modeling language, which is uh, represented as a diagram. But behind the scenes, it's actually stored as an XML. And like five years ago, we could get away with that, like, like the first year we could say oh it's, we'll get there but nowadays you just need to have a modeling tool um, and we do have a modeling tool we have we have an eclipse plugin we have um we have an, an, an let's say an on-premise a web-based modeling tool we've got one in the clouds uh, an activity dollarfresco.com we've got um, and there are plenty of of tools in the markets out there there are um, let's say visual studio has a plugin for bpmn uh, there are uh, various open source ones too and, and it's 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 interesting because with with using a standard like BPMN 2.0, you can just write or create your your diagram. Both the business people and the developers can work on it, and then that gets feed into Activity or any BPMN 2.0 system for that matter that understands BPMN 2.0. So so we come a long way um, coming from like say ten years ago where there was not really a given standard and there were all these proprietary languages in all these different process engines. 
now we've come with BPMAN two and it's really you know the modeling capabilities have really grown and and by by having a standard, it's not before everybody had their own little modeling tool right and now 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 we with BPMAN it doesn't need to be we can just use the, the modeling tool we want but like like I say every vendor still offers their own modeling tool but I think that that will go away with time I think we've got to to a point where there will be one let's say one modeling tool one one BPMAN modeling tool to rule them all. As I understand it, BPMN2 was meant to provide both a, a modeling standard, something that defines the visual iconography, the, the actual elements used to, to de describe a, a control flow, as well as the runtime semantics. That is correct. It's not just, I remember BPMN1 was mm -hmm. just visual and Beeple was the runtime. Exactly. And yeah. people, exactly. people tried to, to map uh, BPMN, they tried to project it on top of Beeple, but of course there was this incompatibility there's this gap where these two things didn't always have support in each other yes indeed indeed yeah the fact only that that uh, Beeple was not really a directed graph and a BPMN process was a directed graph to start with so you always w would have that translation between the two and then sometimes you get you get funny errors that that doesn't make any sense but just because you have the translation so I think that BPMN 2.0 and, and the reason why it became, uh, or, or the reason why it is nowadays the standard for business process modeling is, is, is twofold. Like you say, it is the runtime bit, which is really important. I think that, and you also have to imagine that getting to that consensus, I think it was really hard. You've got all these big vendors who, who have all their own proprietary languages, let's say, who all offered BPMN and then translated to Beeple or their own proprietary implementation. And they work together to make this standard. And I think that's a really uh, a great, powerful thing they did because because it's not easy, and a lot of uh, probably a lot of, of concessions would have been made. Um, but the result is there. And the second point, not only the runtime is important, but the reason why BPMN two O um, is that popular is that you've got a lot of people, both on the tech side and the non tech side, again who speak that language. You've got all these people trained in BPMN 1.0, right? In, which translates very easily to 2.0 because it's, it's 2.0 is just a superset uh, or visually, or visually spoken. And you've got all these people trained in that modeling language, in that the way of, of expressing your process. And that makes it, yeah, very compelling because you've got this, this trained force of people. And, and yeah, it would be stupid not to use that, right? It would not be stupid to use your business analyst who you've trained into BPMN suddenly make him learn something else. So it's like a, yeah, it's a, it's a chicken or egg problem. It's hard to say where the chicken and the egg is here in the story, but both the runtime and definitely the BPMN standard being taught to a lot of people has led to the success of BPMN. Is the success of BPMN too one of the reasons uh, when you started activity that you uh, abandoned the JPDL style proprietary uh, yeah. control flow language in JPPM? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. So what, what yeah. motivated you, JP, JPDL versus uh, your move to BPMN in JPPM yeah. and activity? Yeah, so I think it was about six or seven years ago, we, we saw that um, by that time, the BPMN 2.0 standard was getting ratified. So it was still in flux, but we saw that it was they were getting to a certain consensus, let's say. And we, we knew that at that point that um, we had to have support for it because because we felt that the market was going to that direction so actually in jbpm at that time we were working on jpm4 um, so you have to remember that 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 jbpm3 was already out there for for quite a few years and there was need for a rewrite so we started working on jbpm4 and doing jbpm4 we we still had jpdl support for backwards compatible reasons but we also started implementing bpm 20 on the same engine and one of the reasons why, because I just know that question will come, the reasons why we why we left uh, then then the JPM project was that we we felt that we needed to make that Apache licensed because if we didn't make it Apache licensed, then somebody else would come make an Apache licensed BPM N two O engine, and by having that license would get traction because people a lot of companies look at different open source projects and they if they can choose between let's say between two licenses they will typically choose the most liberal one which is the apache license so we would lose against maybe something that will be inferior to our product because of licensing issues so we we brought it up with red hat um, and we tried to convince them but we couldn't in the end and that's why we why we started the activity project under the apache license now looking back funnily enough uh, by now uh, the jpm project is now apache license so something must have changed 
in Red Hat there. I don't know anymore because I'm, I'm gone there for a long time now. But definitely at the time, that was our a big motivation for us to start the activity project. We wanted to be Apache licensed because otherwise we knew we would lose to something else which would be Apache licensed. You left Red Hat with JBBM founder Tom Baines and you started the activity project at Alfresco. What was the reception at Alfresco? Why Alfresco instead of Player X? And where is Tom? Right. So I'll start with the first part. <laughs> it is um, so basically Alfresco just came at the right time, at the right place. Um, so we were having this discussion internally in Red Hat. We were asking for, look, can we can we rebrand our JPM thing to be the Apache license process engine? Can we can we do that? That was a hard a hard battle at the time. Uh, there was also the the I, th- I think you remember it from from back then. There was also the let's say, discussion between what should be the BPM engine in, in JBoss Red Hat. That was a huge discussion we had, which didn't have any solution when, when, we, when we were left. But it was still in flux uh, when we left. And at that point, uh, Alfresco came along and they said, look, we are looking for um, a replacement for JPM 3 in the Alfresco product. So um, just for the, for the listeners, Alfresco is an ECM, an enterprise content management system, which has uh, a workflow component. So to, to route, uh, let's say, documents from one person to another or to other other stuff, then they used JBPM3 uh, back in the day. And they, they, they knew Tom and, and me back in the day uh, because we met up regularly. So they came to us and they say, look, we've got this problem. We, they had two problems. One was the licensing issue. So they were changing all of their codes also to be uh, more liberal. And JBPM was one component, which was uh, LGPL license back, back then. So they, they had that problem because of they, they, I think they had some deals going on and some, you know, some huge deals, which, which the customer was making, making problems of that license issue. And secondly, they had some performance issue uh, with it. So Alfresco did their whole rewrite. So originally it was based on Hibernate um, and f- they found that, that it was hard to get per- the raw performance out of it, which they wanted. Um, because they have a very specific use case. Obviously, it's not just any CRUD application. They have a very specific uh, database load. Uh, so they, they migrated to MyBatis um, in the time, but they still had JBPM. And they, they some customers, they had issues with, with that being being Hibernate-backed and having performance issues with JBPM3. So they came to us with asking, hey, would you be able to do an, an open source Apache licensed version of, of, of JBPM with also taking into account, you know, architectural changes that would make it more performant for certain use cases, and and yeah, they happen to be at the right time, at the right place, and that's how it <laughs> how it came to be. So in essence, uh, a customer ended up being the yeah. host. Yeah. for that's a very yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. that's a dedicated customer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So so actually, before that, Alfresco was let's say a user of JVPM three, like many others were at the time, and they they yeah. They they just said, look, we need this is important for us, uh, and I don't I don't actually know if that deal actually the deal that triggered that that particular question asked me knows it actually worked out in the end, uh, but yeah, that that's how it came to be. Uh, and so your second question was about Tom, right? Where where he is now? So um, so Tom left Activity I think two and a half years ago now, and um, yeah, uh, of course that that was a uh, yeah for me because because I I owe Tom a lot. I've got a huge respect for him. I learned a lot from him, and and yeah. I owe him a lot professionally, let's say. So I, we do see each other a lot. So he's doing now um, his, his startup. He's called Effective. And he yeah, he's having a lot of fun. And I think knowing Tom is that that after 10 years of doing Java process engines, he was kind of looking for a new challenge. And, and doing the same thing with Activity was after 10 years, as you can imagine, that he wanted to do something new. And that's what he's now doing with, with Effective. And I'm, yeah, I'm wishing him all the luck. And we do see each other a lot. Let's say we, we have this habit of, of having lunch together, which, yeah, I think is awesome. <laughs> I see. Good. You mentioned a few different things I wanted to touch on. One was persistence. I wanted to look a little bit at the implementation of activity as a workflow management system. Mm-hmm. You mentioned persistence uh, with MyBetis mm-hmm. as one mm-hmm. of the sort of motivations for the rewrite. Yep. Internally, a workflow system is describing a control flow language. And I think a lot of what we've seen in in the last sort of 40 years evolution was this embrace of the directed graph. What kind of persistence is required to adequately persist a a control flow language like BPMN? Is it a graph? Is it, does it lend itself to, I mean, does it work well with a SQL-based, RDBMS-based persistence? Mm -hmm. 
Yep, that's a very good question. Um, and that's actually one of the major differences between, let's say, JPM 3 and 4 and, well, not 4 actually, because in 4 we also made a change already, but activity and JPM 3 for sure, is that from a persistence point of view, back in the day in JPM 3, we did persist the whole graph as a graph. And then you have to, you know, uh, basically split out all the different nodes, the, the, the transitions between them. You have to kind of put that in a, in a relation database. And, and that's not an easy thing because relational database doesn't really map very well onto that, that concept. Um, now, with activity, we took a completely different approach is that um, we don't store the graph relationally. We store, we store the, let's say, the XML, the definition of the graph. We store it in the database. And whenever that process definition is needed, we fetch it from a database, parse it, and keep it in a cache in, in activity. And actually, that has has given us a lot of flexibility because um, if you store it relationally, that means you always have to take into account backwards compatibility. And it's very hard to add new features to, to that graph definition. It's very hard to add new, let's say, new, new uh, just to give you an example, uh, if you if you want to store tomorrow on a task, let's say user task in the process, if you want to store some metadata on there, that will not be as easy in relation database um, version of that graph as we have now. Now we can have like like a very easy migration. We add it and we just take in account that there might be new features in that in that parsing. While before it was really hard to add new features, we did it, but it was always a huge migration, which is never fun for everybody. Does it sort of become an exercise in? mapping XML schema to your uh, tables? Yes, that, that, what, that was indeed what it became um, in the end, and that's not a fun place to be. And you lose a lot of flexibility in, in that translation because it's very very rigid and very strict. So that's one of the reasons why we switched that approach, and I'm very happy we did that. That's one of the major things architecturally we, we did with Activity, which has given us a lot of, of features, a lot of, of speed in implementing features in, in, in the past. Um, but coming back to your graph question, actually the runtime version is sort of a uh, graph. So um, I'm not going to go into details here, but basically an activity process instance execution. So you've got your process definition, which is describing how it works, and then you've created a process instance out of that. The process instance itself is actually a tree of what we call executions um, or, or tokens, right? If you, if you uh, are familiar with that term. Basically, we keep a tree of tokens to point where you are in the process. So suppose you, you, your process starts, you go into some parallelism in the beginning, like three parallel branches, then you would have three pointers, three executions in activity, three pointers in that tree. So although we don't have a graph definition-wise, we do have a graph runtime-wise, we, we know where we are in the graph and we have pointers in the form of the tree to that graph. So, so definitely, I mean, graph theory, it's, it's not... The heavy mathematics isn't, isn't there. I mean, we do have, uh, of course, the, the simple graph theory, mathematics like uh, breadth first, um, uh, the, the, and all that, you know, uh, algorithms, the extra, whatever, that is in there because you need it for some use cases, obviously. But it's, it's in the end, the graphs, let's say, mathematically, they aren't that complicated, even though we've seen process definitions over, let's say, I think the, the maximum I once saw was uh, for a customer in the United States was over 250 steps in one process. And that, that, is, that is a huge poster. It was printed on a poster, that process definition. So that, that is an interesting problem. But from a graph point of view, it is, I mean, once you, once you take into account the, the cyclic things, you know, you, that, that you, you have to take into account that you, you, you can't go into a cycle in the graph. Yeah, that's pretty much, pretty much it from a graph tier point of view. Does the decoupling between the process definition and the runtime uh, structure, does that give you a little bit of flexibility to change the persistence? Yes, actually that's, that's a very fair, fair question. And, and that question comes up a lot in the last, let's say, a year, two years maybe, um, but certainly the last year. We've seen a lot of people being interested in graph databases from the likes like Neo4j, but also others. And because it lends very well to process execution. Obviously, you've got your process definition, which is a graph, and you've got your process execution, which can very easily be represented as an instance of that graph, and you just keep where you are in the in, in the process instance. Um, I did do a little side project a while ago, uh, which is, it, it's on my GitHub account, it's activity neo 4 j uh, It was just a, a prototype, it's not production worthy or anything, just to, to prove that it could be done. It, it's actually very easy. Now, um, we are currently, let's say, if you would want to do it today, 
then it's not as easy to to do because uh, yeah through the years yeah, like i say activity is now almost five years old now um a lot of the persistence let's say is leaked into other layers not not intentionally you know how it goes but it did and so currently we are actually doing a really big refactoring of of our whole engine and and that is one bit of it is that we're refactoring the the way data and entities are stored um, in the engine and so after that refactoring it will be a lot easier to separate all that database backend with something like neo4j or mongo even although i like neo4j more because it has transactions so um, you have to keep in mind that transactions are really important for uh, for business process management engine because if something goes wrong when you're executing a process you want to go back to the previous stable state and if you lose transactions like in mongo DB, you would need to actually do the transactional compensation yourself, and that's not an easy problem to solve. That's that's quite a bit of work to, to actually solve. Interesting. You mentioned a few different things. One is this idea of parallelism. When you enter some sort of concurrence in the process definition, that's a logical concurrence. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily translate to no. runtime concurrency. No. Does it? Although you, although you no although you can so um, let's say the default is that if you go into what we call in BPM to a, a parallel gateway for example, it is let's say business parallelism. So from a from a technical point of view, we will go into the first branch, execute it. Go into the second branch, execute everything that follows. Go into the third branch, etc. So even though for for the business user, let's say it is semi parallel because a lot of things going on in the same transaction, but from a technical point of view, it is not. But we do have a feature in activity called async continuations, and that is a feature which is, uh, or a concept which is not in the BPMento standard. It means that on every step in the process, you can set, okay, this is async, asynchronous, and at that point, your transaction will stop, will commit to the database, and a component which we call the job executor will, at a certain point in the future, and typically that's very shortly afterwards, will take that piece of work and do it completely. Uh, async in a in a fully parallel threaded way so but that's a real technical thing and and we found out through the years that actually when you mix those two people get confused so you don't want to ask your business users to define parallel concurrency in your process you don't want them to define those boundaries that is something really for for technical people that is why in activity it is it is like a property on your step but we we typically business people won't use it they won't see it they won't need it that's really something for people that understand process execution and, and yeah, concurrency in, in, in yeah, systems. Does BPMN provide a way for business people to annotate the process definition in a way that is separate from the way technical people will annotate the process definition? So BPMN 2.0 has, uh, let's say, levels of, of you, can, you can get a high-level view of the process, which is interesting for business people, and then you can dive into, into the process definition, let's say, raw details. And with the activity, we actually go a step further. So in, in any step, you can add technical, let's say, technical listeners. So for example, if you are taking a transition in activity, you can add like a transition listener or what we call in BPM a sequence flow listener, which will not be visible for the business people, but will might do something technical like doing a database call or sending out an event to an event bus or doing a JMS call, whatever. Um, that is hidden from the business user. So there is definitely, you know, that, that different view on the same source um, in, in BPMN for sure. And that's really important also for the success of BPMN. You don't want to overload business people with all those technical details. And, and to be fair, there are not, in a typical process, you will have some of these technical uh, pieces, but it's not overwhelming. It's not that every step needs to be annotated by tech people to make it work. Because as you said uh, in a couple of questions earlier, the, the value of BPMN 2.0 is that it is runtime, right? So, so typically you won't need to do it unless you want to do some specific things. And that's a really powerful feature of, of BPMN. The technical listeners, it, that seems like that would be one way for people to integrate with backend systems, to integrate workflow into other systems or to at least make other systems aware of workflow. Yes, that is correct. That is typically how they're used. So, um, for example, one, one of the... Um, Let's say we have a commercial offering in activity uh, in Alfresco. And one of the things we do there is we, we do add these listeners to the process. So we've got, in activity, we've got this concept of, of parse handlers. So as a, as a developer, you can add parse handlers and they allow you to basically add behavior to your process definition generally. 
So you can say for every of my uh, user tasks, I want to add this behavior to it for every in my system. And that's what we do. And then we that generates, let's say, a cer certain event. And then we feed that event into a system like we, we are now using Elasticsearch, but you can feed it into anything you want, right? And then we use that data in Elasticsearch to, to gather some, some reporting or to do some predictive analysis. And that is indeed the real, the real power. So business users, they typically don't care about that. They want it, of course. They want the results of, of gathering that data, but they, they don't want to see that in their process. But as a developer, you do want to know where exactly that the event is being fired or where that data is being produced or what is actually in that data you're sending out. So, so yeah, you're absolutely right. That is, that is where you would do that. When you talk about data, what do you mean? Do you, are you referring to the parameters into a, a process instance? Mm -hmm. What is data in this case? And, and how yeah. does the designer of the process definition articulate yeah. that data or, or, yeah. or describe that's, it? That's a good question, yeah. So um, you've got kinds of data in a process. You've got the data that, that a user produces. Typically, you have to think that forms being filled in through a web form or a mobile app or whatever. Those are typical forms, text inputs, uh, checkbox, and et cetera. Th those come in and those will map somehow Onto, onto a data model, right? So, you, for example, the let's say a name text field in a form might map to a name entity in your data model. Um, now, it is a good practice in activity, and it's, it's a debate we have for a long time. Um, uh, we've got proponents and we've got people going against it, but my personal feeling is that you don't want to store your data in, in, the, in a process instance. The process instance is there to root the data, to make decisions based on the data, but it isn't there to store data. You can do it because we have the facilities to store that data, but yeah, the process engine is not a good place to actually store those things. You've got better, way better stuff out there to store your data. And what we advise generally is that you store your data externally and you reference them in your process. So typically, um, for example, let's say the Alfresco integration we have, we don't store, if, if you would do a process with a document, we don't store the document, obviously, in the process. You could do that, but we don't. We store it in Alfresco, and we only keep a reference to that, to that document in the process um, because you need to have some way where, where you have the master data, right? And it shouldn't be the process. And the process engine is not optimized for, for that kind of, of, of load, let's say. It's not a data retrieval thing, although it can do that, but, yeah, it's not, it's not that optimal. Is that a uh, sort of claim check? pattern for workflow yeah yeah it is it is actually yeah that's right but like i say there is a there's this huge yeah <laughs> in, the, in the five years activity now exists typically on the forum it comes every month that somebody asks this question and there's a huge debate always about why not or why would it be so my personal uh, yeah experience and, and doing this also in the field as a consultant uh, back in the day is uh, don't do it it will it will get back to you it will blow up in your face afterwards when suddenly you need that data somewhere else and then you need to go to the process engine and yeah that's that's not the nice thing to have um, and coming back to your question is is that it makes sense to have it in the model now that's something where activity i have to be fair is not very strong at the moment but we're investing in that so it is it would be cool if you if you can model your data model together with your process definition where you can say look i've got this form input and it maps onto this data model like this and then, like I say, I, we don't want to store it in activity. That could be, for example, a JPA entity, which is stored somewhere completely in a different table from activity. Um, but we do have a very good JPA integration, so, so we just store the identifier. We don't store the whole JPA entity. And, and yeah, that will, from, from a modeling point of view, for a business user, user, that would make a lot of sense because then you would see the flow of your data, you know, the input form, the, uh, let's say, decision, the, the, let's say, a rule that's being invoked with a certain point of data. Uh, a certain piece of data, a property of a data being fed into a service task and into a service call, into a web service, whatever that, seeing that flow makes a lot of sense. But like I say, I have to be fair, that's something which you can do already today with activity technically, no problem, but our tooling currently isn't, yeah, isn't um, there at the moment. And the BPM 2.0 specification isn't, let's say, it does have some, some constructs for that, but it's not rich enough. It's really XML, let's say, tailored. It's not... You can define your XSD and you can define an XML entity that flows through the process, but yeah, like I say, nobody really uses XML, hopefully, anymore to store data, right? We all use uh, JPA or, or JSON, uh, for that matter. So do, do people end up passing along IDs 
as parameters or variables in the process? Yes, often, often. So, well, well, people won't, let's say, won't do it. It will be behind the scenes, some, something in the back end that would do that for them. So, for example, you would have like a form, you fill in kind of a bit of pieces, and that would then create, you would call another service typically. So, so you would call another service to create that entity somewhere else, and you would get, get back an ID. Um, you're, you're not going to create an entity, that data, in the process itself. You're going to gather the, the, the input from the user, you're going to use that in, in, in all kinds of different ways, but you, the creation itself and the storing itself is externally is doing is being done by by a, yeah, a little service that lives somewhere else, typically in, in your system. I see. Does the usage of activity uh, change how you interact with backend systems? For example, I know that you can deploy activity as a as a standalone REST API, yep. or you can embed it in your Java JVM application that's right yeah what does it look like for for me as somebody who's trying to integrate listeners and back-end service calls to deploy to a rest server versus deploying embedded does it change can i do i have the full power yeah first of all that that is mostly let's say style and how your organization typically integrates so i'd say if you really want the the embedded way is 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 really powerful in the sense that you can integrate with your if you're using spring transactions for example you can integrate with the spring transactions really easily you can, you can annotate your method saying add transactional above that which make that method transactional and then do let's say one piece of logic for example do a jpa call in spring whatever and then do something with the process in the same transaction that's really powerful that's something you can't do with a REST server. That's actually the main point about the difference between embedded versus standalone is that doing a REST call, you will lose the transactional transactionality of your of your of your logic. It is a different style. It is and let's say it's more like a client server relationship where you go to the to the server, ask, okay, I have this data, what is my next step? Or where am I now in the process? And then you do something based on that. That is a client-server relationship. While embedded, you don't have that relationship. It is really mixed. Your your logic, your code is intermixed together, and and which leads to very powerful integrations and makes your life as a developer easier. So let's say I'm a fan of the of the embedded way. Um, I always used to uh, when I did did consultancy uh, for BPM projects. I always try to go into the embedded way. But with with the customers we have in, in Alfresco, we do see some companies they have a lot of services. And they standardize on HTTP REST, and they communicate only to HTTP REST. And, and I can see that from an architectural point of view, of course, that makes a lot of sense. What do the customers ask for? I mean, if if some of them are coming to you because they want an embedded wor- workflow management system, and some want a standalone server, what are the typical s- customer stories or use cases? Right. What's the right. and and for activity, what does a success look like? Right, a successful customer. Yeah, so we've got broadly two kinds of customers, let's say. Um, the first one is the customer looking for system orchestration. Um, they have all kinds of different services in their organization, and they are looking for something to stitch that together, to glue all that together. And that is where, where a process engine like activity is really powerful, where you can say, okay, I've, I'm calling this service now, and then depending on the data coming back from that service, I'm going to this direction. And that direction, etc. And that, that is typically system orchestration with very little human interaction. That is one kind of customer. Let's say roughly half and half we see it. The other half is the customer looking for a very strongly human interaction. You've got typically documents. A lot of of the process uh, processes we see in the fields always involve some kind of documents being being passed around, some approval needed, some annotation on documents being needed. And there is not that much system integration, actually. It's more about humans. It's more about end users filling in forms. And then you have a really, yeah, the demand for the forms, let's say the form engine is really, really high. That, that, is, that is the other spectrum. The system integrators, the system orchestration people, they don't really care about all that UI and forms. They just want an engine that is really fast and can do all that stuff uh, at a performant way without having to spin up 10 nodes. And yeah, the other ones are, are interested in yeah, rich modeling of forms, rich modeling of user interactions. And that's a different kind of user. Let's say from a performance point of view, <laughs> I, do like the, uh, I do like the human interactions more because for the engine, that is, that is basically nothing. It is going from one stable weight state to another stable weight state. 
that is peanuts for the engine. But if you're talking about system orchestration, then you're talking, some of our customers are talking about millions of process instances that are doing a peak, uh, have to be done in, in an hour. So millions in an hour and that, yeah, then you're challenging the engine, obviously, uh, to, which is which is fun. Let's say from a technical point of view, that is fun because uh, I like a performance challenge. But uh, let's say it is easier to talk with somebody, a customer that needs human human interaction story. Um, so what does success look like for activity? That That is a good question. Um, so activity is being used all across the globe. It's amazing uh, to, to sometimes learn where, where your engine is being used. And, and actually, uh, the sad thing about being an open source project is that you, you actually only know it when they have a problem, when they have something. So they, they might be doing activity for three years already, suddenly they have a problem, then you know they have an activity installation you have an activity usage but before that we don't know and that's that's of course the yeah the pain of open source is that everybody can download your code can fork your code can can do whatever but there's no you know there's no feedback loop often and that's a bit of the sad story about open source is that uh, i think with commercial products with pure, pure commercial products that that direct link with the customer is there straight away and you know your use cases um, that being said we do know a lot of our use cases all across the globe and like i say we we um we are in Europe, all across all the countries, let's say. We are in the United States, we're in China, we're in Australia. And success for activity is based, yeah, it's, very, it's a very cliche answer, but it's when the customer is happy. So um, in Alfresco, we do work very customer driven is that if a customer has a demand, he wants a new feature, he has a bug, that has the highest priority. And, and we do, yeah, we do work to fix those things as soon as possible. So when the customer is happy, then we're happy. It's cliche, but... But Fair enough. That's the way it is. Yeah, that that's what gets our paycheck paid, right? <laughs> are are there certain you mentioned routing of documents for mm-hmm. approval? Are there some other standout use cases that you can mention or talk about? Some other pretty interesting uh, customer stories you can think of? Yeah, I've got a lot of uh, interesting ones. Uh, fortunately, some of the really cool ones like, I'm not allowed to talk about <laughs> uh, with with the yeah commercial, which yeah I always find it sad, but. Uh, one interesting one, now, uh, now you mentioned it, one interesting, last month uh, we were at CERN in Genève. Uh, so CERN is the um, nuclear research center in, in Europe. Uh, they do pretty cool stuff. Uh, we got a tour of the Hydron Collider. So we went down in, in the cave and we saw the Hydron Collider being being worked on because they, it wasn't running. You can't go in there when it's running, obviously. That's pretty dangerous stuff. But it was there was being being closed down for a couple of days for yeah just maintenance. And that was really awesome. So they they are using at CERN, uh, they are using activity uh, on a quite yeah let's say a quite um, big big implementation, and they're using it for all kinds of processes. Typically for getting approval. So they've got a whole approval system in CERN, uh, which is very complex. They use it to get to get approval for for buying stuff for for uh, uh, let's say to, to to get new equipment to um, to to basically get new people hired and all that. But they also use it for onboarding. So you arrive at the com- at, at the at, at the, the location, and then the whole process kicks off, getting you onboarded. What else do we have? We've got customers doing image image processing with activity. That's an interesting other use case. It's that they gather all kinds of of images. I can't talk about the details, but and then they do recognition on those images through a process. And depending so so depending on the analysis of the image, it might have to go to an expert or not. So if the computer did a good job. Then it just passes. But if the computer thinks, okay, I don't think this is a good result, it goes to an expert, and the expert will actually, uh, yeah, read that. So we are very strong, let's say, in financial um, institutions. So, so that's that's more of a system orchestration bit where there's kind of a yeah brokerage between all kinds of of, of different financial services, and they're they're yeah yeah. I don't know how it all works. I'm not a financial expert, but basically it's. A, it's a lot of complex servers interacting with each other and making money somehow magically. <laughs> I don't know how it works. I, I would like to know, but uh, yeah. So you've mentioned two different use cases: uh, mm-hmm. human task lists, uh, moving people through a process, and orchestration of services. I'm curious, what does activity know about people? How do you describe resources like a like a user or a group? Is that right. right? Does it tie into a backend system, or it does? So the they say the engine ships with a default database backed user group service, let's say, um, which is fairly simple and just to get you going, right? But um, in our experience, ninety nine percent 
of of the users out there of the customers out there they are using LDAP and and often it's Active Directory and and so we've got a an Active Directory and LDAP uh, connector into that and and we just fetch that information out of LDAP so so uh, yeah it's not much much going on there that's that's yeah, that's what it is. There's nothing, let's say, sexy about it. LDAP is how, how old? I don't know, 40 years, 50 years. I don't know how old the protocol is. But uh, yeah, that's still today, it is what most people use. Okay. And then from the other side, when it comes to orchestrating services, we talked about transactions. And I think about a lot of common long running processes that people are grappling with today. And it seems like a process definition would be a good place to build in compensating transactions for things that don't otherwise have it, right? So you could, you, yep. you should be, able, is it, am I wrong? Or I'm, I'm, it no, seems like that would be a, a nice way to model. Absolutely, absolutely. Compensatory transactions around things that are otherwise not transactional. So yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Process definitions are a very good way of expressing that. And it's, it's very underused, um, let's say, in the field. In a process definition and in BPMN, we have specific constructs to define, look, this is what is what is called a business transaction, which doesn't map to a database transaction. And you can fire an event when some, uh, let's say, some situation occurs, which isn't normal. And if that event is fired and being catched somewhere else, you can define a whole flow to compensate what you were doing. You can go rewinding stuff. Now, that's not always as easy because sometimes you're sending out that's, uh, emails or SMS or you're doing some non-transactional work. Rewinding that isn't easy, but at least with, let's say, the compensating transactions functionality, at least you can try to mitigate that, try to do something about it. Uh, but like I say, not a lot of people in the field are using that today. They're, they're modeling the happy part and yeah, not thinking about the what what if this service does something that I didn't expect it to be. And yeah, that is if we go in and we help customers, that is something that you know you have to create a mindset for those customers. You have to they have to think about okay, this is how I work regularly, but what if some situation occurs that it wasn't expected? Um which brings me to an interesting other point, Josh, is that uh, that's that's really a trend nowadays, let's say, in, in the business process management space is that the dynamic work, let's say. So you've got your structured process, you've got the typical way of doing things. And nowadays, that's not enough anymore. We've got people, knowledge workers out there who are sometimes smart enough to say, okay, good, I know that this is the structure to follow, but this situation actually needs something else. I need to quickly assign a task to this guy or do something else here. And that is something which we're currently working on very hard in activities to, to support those use cases where in, in any given point in the process, you can say, all right, this is the flow, which is normally the flow, but I'm doing an exception now here. I'm creating an exceptional flow. I'm creating an exceptional task. I'm, I'm doing something else here. And I'm calling a completely exceptional sub-process here only for this instance of the process, not for all, all the other ones. And that's something that is currently really yeah, important in all in all the products uh, in the BPM market, and definitely activity is is is, is implementing and, and, and support for that. It's already possible now in in some respect, but we're adding yeah a lot of more cool features in that now. I see. For me, I think about today's world of lots of small, singly focused, uh, what are commonly called microservices, and. I wonder, does using a workflow engine help there? For example, does the ability to model compensatory transactions make it easier to string together these complex services in a long-running process? When you have to talk to back-end services that may or may not be in transaction, does activity have something, does it help there? What does is, what is that threading model look like? What does it look like yep. to, to call to microservices? Absolutely. So, so, yeah. so, so the microservice approach makes an awful lot of sense uh, using using process engines with a microservice approach um, and, and typically BBM has been used in all kind of, I mean <laughs> microservices and and, in, and before was was service oriented architectures I mean BPM has always played a big role in that because a process engine allows you to glue those different services together uh, like you say with compensation but also just a service on itself is just a service it does one thing right it does one thing good and that's it. It doesn't have any context around what is actually is the, the let's say the grand scheme of things. And the process is actually 
the one who gives meaning to that 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 context, who give who creates that ground scheme of thing. Now, the process engine in such an architecture is typically again another microservice, let's say, but it has a more let's say in depth knowledge of all the other services. Uh, more than any other service, let's say. Of course, the microservices services do speak with each other, but a process engine typically knows the whole topology of the architecture. We do have a lot of integrations there. If, you, if you're talking about threading models, we do have out of the box, you know, synchronous way, synchronous -y. The synchronous way is the default, but uh, as I said before, on any step, you can set an async property that would make it by default already asynchronous and do it all in a threaded way. And then we've got um, integrations with various uh, frameworks, such as, as you probably know, uh, Spring Spring Integration, Camel, uh, and all kinds of others. Uh, we also have integration with Mule and all that. But those allow you, definitely Camel and Spring Integration, they allow you to have a very complex out-of-process behavior where you can say, look, I'm firing all, let's say, for example, I'm firing in the JMS uh, thing to this queue. And, and doing this in the same thing in another queue, and depending on this response, I'm going back into this. And that's a really powerful thing. And we do see a lot of people using that uh, in the field. So, so that integration is actually yeah, very popular, let's say. We do have a lot of pull requests uh, for, for those components uh, at the moment. I see. Does that help the workflow system scale out? Does a workflow engine like Activity have a single point of failure? And what does it mean to scale that out? How do you scale out workflow yeah. systems? Yeah. So activity by, by implementation architecture is, let's say, stateless in the sense that any engine, so any engine instance, you can have, like I say, it, it can be used embedded. So you can even do it in your own little application. You can boot up 10 process engines. That's, that's, that's possible. Um, but typically you won't do that. You would have different machines in, in, a, in a clustered, uh, well, not clustered in a, because they, they don't need to be clustered, they just need to be there with a the load balancer in front, right? Because every instance of the engine, embedded or REST, can take any request of anything, any process definition. So, but, of course, there is no silver bullet. We do have a single point of failure in the database. So every of these nodes of these engine instances, they go to the same database. So we kind of, yeah, put the responsibility on the database administrator in a way that, that that is a single point of failure. If the database goes down, then, yeah, you're basically you're, you're screwed because then your engines won't work anymore. But as long as your database can cope with the traffic, and there are ways to, to scale those databases, obviously, independently from the process engine, as long as it can cope with the load, you can add horizontally new instances to your architecture and put a load balancer in front of it and... That's just it. Very simple. We don't have any session. We don't have any, let's say, caches um, beyond the process definition cache. And that cache is rebuilt on every node. So it's a, yeah, by default, that is something that we learned from, from uh, experience and the past implementations that that needs to be stateless to be really performant. You can't, you can't have it in any other way. But does it help being able to talk to other systems, for oh, example, yeah. over a queue yeah. or? Yes, yes, absolutely. Like RPC absolutely. or something like that. Yes. Offload yes. some of the yes, absolutely, in absolutely. That sorry, I, I, you asked that question indeed. That is really important because, um, like I say, our activity is actually a transactional engine that brings you from one stable state to another stable state with an arbitrary number of steps in between. And of course, transactions are database transactions are not meant to be open for a very long time, right? You don't let's say you don't want to do some heavy calculations in there, which takes minutes or even hours at that point. So what you typically do, and that's what, what, what a lot of people are using it for, is you would have, uh, let's say, a callback mechanism where you put the workload to some external system, right? Using Spring Integration, Camel, or any other system we have integration with, put it there, and then have a callback whenever that work is done. The, the process, at that point, the process is already in a stable state. It is, it is committed to the database, and it is just waiting until an external trigger comes in. And so when that external trigger comes in, it just continues the process. But the process engine, between those two points, the process engine is not using up any resources, memory-wise, CPU-wise. It just stores its data in a database, and that's it, waiting there potentially forever. We've got customers having processes which run over three years, so you don't want those things in memory for three years. No, that just goes in the database until the external trigger is received, and then you continue. Does the... Workflow management system provide ways to help move the process towards a, a valid final state. Things like, for example, escalation 
to make sure that something just doesn't doesn't just sit there in the state for you know forever. Yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. So um, it does, but often you have to model it. So, like I say, timers, escalation. So you can on any task on anything you can set a timer. If that timeout happens, then you do something else or an escalation. If if something isn't answered within so many business days, you can escalate to somebody else. The engine has the features and the capabilities for it, but often you need to to model them. Um, and there are always exceptions. So, um, for example, somebody leaves a company, right? What if what what do you have to do with those tasks? So, we do have uh, support for that in our APIs and our, our our let's say our UIs have support for that in the sense that an administrator can go into the system and see, okay, these are the tasks for that uh, user which has now left the company and move them to somebody else or do something else with it, continue it manually or whatever. Um, so yeah, the engine definitely has capabilities for it, but it's not free. It's not that the engine suddenly will, you know, send you an email if, if, if it happens to, to run to run for, for a month, uh, waiting for input for a month. No. So you have to model it explicitly. Does that create extra a burden? Does that create an extra burden on the engine? Does it keep state somewhere to, to follow up or to track those timers um, and so on? It, it does um, in, in a way that indeed you those timers are, are also persisted into a database and ever so often uh, we do the, the job executor component of activity checks if there are timers to be fired at that point. But that, let's say, that burden is is yeah very very low performance wise. So we did a huge our last release, the activity five seventeen, had a huge uh, refactoring of the job executor. So we had a customer, really big customer, uh, who um, was using job executor for millions per hour of of jobs, and it they found out that some specific use cases it didn't scale, and they were right. So in the last release, we did a huge refactoring of that job executor and it's now way more performant than before and can handle huge loads of, of of those things but generally that customer is really an exceptional case but generally even high let's say the, the, the financial institutions which I talked about they never get to a certain load where it gets to be a problem uh, for activity. I see. Are there any other questions that I've missed? Anything you would add? Oh yeah that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, it is, of course, very hard to just try to explain what an engine is, process engine like activity is, in, in just yeah, an hour or something. I, one thing that I do see in a lot of, of let's say, uh, people starting out with activity is that they find it really overwhelming in the sense that there is this whole BPM 2 standard, this kind of a language, kind of a concepts you have to get your head around before you can actually do something reasonable with it. And, and people... They tend to go into you know I just add the, the library to my project and let's see from there and but it yeah that that will backfire so do spend a bit of time we have a I mean of course I wrote a huge part of it but I think we have a good documentation a good user guide on activity.org um, do spend some time first there, don't just take you a few minutes we've got a getting started in five minutes thing but do try to embrace the BPM 2 concept before you actually start um, with, with, with yeah, using it for real. It will help you a lot. We often get questions about on the forum or people sending us emails, hey, um, I want to do this, but but how the hell do you do this with activity? And then it's, it's, it is there just in the user guide in the first couple of chapters. It is there and that's, yeah, it always pains me to, to, to see. <laughs> I know it's, a, it's an old thing to, to, to read the fine manual in open source, right? But... Uh, yeah, it is something is true about that. Okay, yeah. I, I will be sure to put the user yeah. guide and any, any other documentation in the show notes. Yeah. Beyond that, we, I mean, activity is a very popular project. Uh, let's say from a contribution point of view, so we we have a lot of pull requests. Uh, it's it's a, yeah, it's mental to keep up with all the pull requests we get, which is which is awesome. But yeah, I mean, the threshold to contribute to activity is very low. I mean, from from I know a lot of open source projects. And I've contributed to quite a few of them, but but our threshold for contribution is is very low. Even if it's just changing something in the user guide or or writing a bit of of or even writing a blog, that is really valuable contribution for us, just to get the word out, just to get the world know know that activity is out there. That is really important to us. Where do people go to learn more about activity and to contribute and to find the code? Yeah, so the code is on GitHub. It's GitHub.com/activity. With an I, not with a Y. It's always confusing people. 
Um, and then on activity.org, uh, that is where everything is linked to all the other stuff. So that is where we're linked to the forums, to the code on GitHub, to the um, just uh, FAQ about all, a lot of stuff, to how to commit, and then the blog. So um, on our, on our, also on our website, there is a blog role where you can see all kinds of blogs. And I try to write a lot of blogs, very simple things like how do you create a pull request to activity? How do you just boot up? The environment for the first time and I try to make that as, as easy as possible and there are a lot of people uh, yeah, using those those resources. Where can people go to learn more about you? <laughs> there, there isn't much to learn about me. Uh, I've got my blog which is uh, yorambares.com or dot, dot .be they all go to the same place and but it's all very technical so I try to write uh, about technical stuff mostly about activity but also if something just technically interests me I write about it and, and that's where mostly I spend my time also on Twitter, so I do tweet. Uh, I think I tweet fairly often. Uh, it's just jbarres, twitter.com jbarres. And I tweet a lot about our fresh connectivity. So, uh, yeah, I love my job, uh, as you might have already gathered. Well, thank you very much, Joram, for joining me. Oh, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's truly an honor. Everything we've just talked about, I'll reflect all the links in the uh, show notes. If you have any links you want me to include there, please do. To those listening, we want to hear from you. There are many different ways you can reach us. You can comment on the show on our website at seradio.net, se-radio.net, or email us at team at se-radio.net. We're also available on Twitter at at seradio, on LinkedIn or Google+, Plus in our groups, Software Engineering Radio, and we're available on Facebook uh, on our page named Software Engineering Radio. This is Josh Long for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more information about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To support us, you can advertise SE Radio by clicking the Dig, Reddit, Delicious, or Slashdot buttons on the site, or by talking about us on Facebook, Twitter, or your own blog. If you have feedback specific to an episode, please use the commenting feature on the site so that other listeners can respond to your comments as well. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks again for your support.